Well, welcome to a, another hopefully interesting nugget. I gave some on mind rescue, I think it was last time. So it, we've chosen a, a subject which is certainly one of my major interests, and that's moving of water by steam power. So we're going to do a bit of a bit of a chat about steam engines. Um, something if, if you've been to Cornwall, you'll know, hopefully know a little bit about, and we're going to not just be limited to Cornwall. We're going to talk about some other, other places, some of which hopefully you haven't heard of. When I start as an, as a mining engineer, um, one thinks of all the different sort of pieces of equipment, technology that's been used in mining over the years. And I, I would like to think, and hopefully you would agree, that the application of steam power to the pumping of water is probably one of the most important sort of milestones. It certainly allowed the mines in Cornwall and the UK to become a lot larger and a lot deeper than they would have been. And the technology that was certainly developed over here was then exported worldwide um, in one form or another. The Cornish were very good at taking their steam engines with them. And I think, you know, it's only with electrification of pumping that steam then was removed. And the picture in the right hand side is of a typical Cornish pumping engine. This one is at a China clay pit. Uh, I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Goon, might be Goon Veen. But you've got all the, the classic sort of arrangement, you know, engine house, balance box, chimney with a bit of black smoke out of it. Um, rising main coming out. So before we get to where that engine came from, let's sort of go back a period and say, right, before steam was introduced, mining in sort of Devon and Cornwall uh, was really limited by the water table. And I don't know quite where the water table in sort of most mining districts in the States sits, but in Cornwall, the water table is quite high. So you're really limited to about sea level um, as being the base sort of depth that you can go. So with the cliffs on the north coast being about three or four, 400 feet high, if you drove an adit off the bottom of the cliff, then you really would be looking at about sort of 400 feet of sort of mining of nice dry mining. We, the Cornish did try, and in other parts of the UK, they did try pumping water by water wheel. But although if you've ever been to Cornwall, you'll know that we are blessed with good rainfall most of the year. Um, this wasn't really sufficient and the water wasn't always in the right place to allow uh, water wheels to be used to power pumps, although they did start. But it did limit things and it wasn't it. And what the sort of period we're looking at here is we're looking sort of anything up to about 1650. So gradually people, some famous names in the list came, sort of came along and they applied themselves to producing technology which could assist the miners in removal of water. Thomas Savory being the first one, he, he had something he called a fire engine that was developed in about around about 1698. Wasn't the most successful, but it, it started the sort of the journey. The most important gentleman to come along next is, a, is not a Cornishman. And his name is Thomas Newcomen, and he came from Devon. Now, he developed what we call the atmospheric steam engine. And really, that is the basis. Uh, the arrangement that he came up with was of a beam. And we'll show, I've got a diagram of it in a minute. 
and his engines although expensive to run and expensive to buy were the very first i'm going to call pumping engine Hopefully you've all come across the second, the next gentleman on the list. That's James Watt. Probably made the most significant um, advances to and alterations to the arrangement of a beam engine by creating the separate condenser. And he also is credited with the discovering or invention of parallel motion, which we'll talk about in a while. Richard Zavivik, a Cornishman, couldn't, we can't go anywhere without mentioning him. Um, he was the one that introduced high pressure steam to the process. Now, high pressure steam in this case is anything over about 45 PSI. So by modern standards, not very high pressure, but high pressure in this context. Some other gentlemen who Again, some Cornishmen, William Sims, Arthur Wolfe and Samuel Gross, all had their part to play in development of the beam engine. Most of the technology and the, the things that they uh, introduced came about long after what had departed the scene. And at the bottom, I'm going to mention a group of people. They are the Lean family, and we're going to do, talk a little bit about engine recorders and what they did. So we've got a list of, and there probably are, you know, if you were doing a, um, this list is not exhaustive, and there probably are quite a few more people that we could mention, but I thought they were the probably ones that, A, deserve to mention, and B, you probably have heard of. So picture on the left is part of a Newcomen steam engine. This is the only operating one, I think, left in the UK. It had a reciprocating wooden beam. The pumps were at one end would, would be out to the left of the picture and the cylinder at the other. The cylinder was heated by steam and cooled by water, thus creating a vacuum which pulled the piston down. And in this case, the cylinder, it sits at the bottom under vertically underneath the cylinder. And is in this case surrounded by some brickwork. The weight of the rods in the shaft pulled the piston up. Quite simple. However, very inefficient because you are continually putting hot steam into the cylinder, heating it up and then cooling it with cold water to produce a vacuum. So really good at burning, you know, less than 1%, they reckon, efficient for that piece of equipment. However, as the first piece, the first engine to be designed, someone has to do it. And it did, it worked. Um, there are a number or there were a number of um, Newcomen engines installed in Cornwall. One of the books I consulted recommend, reckoned there was probably 2,000 in the UK by about 1,800. Ideally, um, it was ideal if you were close to a coal, a coal field, which we're not in Cornwall. The nearest coal in Cornwall is in South Wales, which all, all of about 100 miles away. So if you've got an engine that's burning large amounts of coal, it's going to cost you quite a lot of money. So we have a beam engine that works. And then this gentleman who was working at the University of Glasgow as an instrument maker was asked to repair a model, a working model it is, of a nuclear engine. Um, and the story goes that he discovered, having looked at this model, that about 80% of the steam is actually wasted in the reheating of the cylinder. So he thought about this and he thought, well, if you can keep the cylinder hot and you can remove the condensing action to a separate item, which could be kept cold and allow the cylinder, the main cylinder remain at operational temperature, things would be a lot better. 
and this thought led to the patent that was granted in 1769, a new method for the lessening of the consumption of steam and fuel in fire engines, which is great, you know, and the lessening of consumption of steam or coal really was the thing that drove this. If you've got high costs for a Newcomen engine, then anything that can reduce costs is going to be good. A little later, he developed the parallel four link parallel motion, which most modern beam engines or quite a few rotative steam engines have. And we'll see photographs of them in a while. As a result of his modifications, coal was the consumption of coal was reduced by about 60%. And it said that the first true what design steam engine produced around about 1775-1776. The power of the steam engine was limited by the use of the low pressure, so anything less than about 30 psi. The size of the cylinder displacement, the shape the, and the size of the condenser. So there were limits to what could be achieved. So if you wanted a lot more power, then you had to have a much bigger steam engine. What had by this time taken out this patent and you had to pay him a royalty based upon the amount of coal that you saved. This patent allowed what to really and his company to really control the development of steam engines for a while while it existed and thus any development beyond what he had developed really was stymied until this patent ran out some of the engines i've seen had brass cylinders um, which again makes them quite expensive But he did, he did set the groundwork for what followed. Whilst he was playing around and they got things going, the, one of the most useful uh, developments, not necessarily from a pumping point of view, but certainly from a steam engine point of view and the use as a power source in other applications was the fact that he, he created the double acting engine where steam drove the piston on both sides whereas pumping engines tended to have steam acting on one side. And it's the use of this sun and planet gear that he came up with, which gave it the rotating ability. But this, as you'll see, is replaced by a crank in later engines. So enter Richard Trevithick. So 1811, he adapts a what engine to use one of his new cylindrical Cornish boilers. So engines up to then had had these cylindrical sort of like, I think um, they called them haystack boilers because they looked a bit more like a cylindrical haystack. But Trevithick had created a long tube like boiler um, that used steam to be raised in, you know, steam pressure to be increased to 40 to 50 PSI, thus introducing the, the concept of what they call at the time as strong steam. About the same time as Richard de Vivick's playing around with his, with his engine modifications, Wolf had developed a compound engine with two cylinders. Now he's looking to increase the power of the engine by using the steam twice. So you have a small cylinder which has high pressure steam in it and then that steam exhausts into a larger one where the steam is at a low, lower pressure and you make use of the steam twice. There were various modifications to the valve gear, how the steam engine actually operates. And as a result of this, um, engines became more reliable. And as we know, they then got exported all over the world. And there are examples of Cornish pumping engines 
being exported to South Africa, Australia, Mexico, and the US. As technology in the rest of the world moved on and electricity became a more standard way of powering equipment, the last Cornish engine was built about 1914 um, for a mine on Carradon Moor. And I think it went into the one which is now the Prince of Wales engine house. Wasn't the end of the story as far as Cornish engines go, because the last engine, the last steam engine to work in Cornwall finished in 1959. But deep mining in Cornwall, the pumping engines at South Crofty, um, which were the last ones to use steam, they shut in 1955. And I was at um, NAMO, the National Association of Mine Historical Associations, uh, conference in 2000. And I met a gentleman there who had actually been in the engine house in Robinson's engine house, the day the engine actually made its last stroke. And he said he was, I was only like three or four at the time. So I went, my dad held me up and I sort of, he sort of could remember a little bit about going there. Right, so what does an engine look like? In simplicity, we have a beam which oscillates. At one end, we have a pump rod made, normally made of pitch pine bearing in size as it goes down the shaft so the the bigger pieces are at the top smaller pieces at the bottom normally in 30 or 40 foot lengths quite often this was um imported from norway or the states i think they said because we don't grow pitch pine over here as far as i know so you've got the separate condenser and air pump, which sit normally outside the engine house in and are submerged in a large wooden system full of water, keeps it cold. You have the cylinder sitting on a large block of stone and is bolted down with very long holding down bolts. Attached to that, you have the various valve gear that can, or nozzles as they are in Cornwall, that control the inlet and outlet of steam. You have the piston rod, goes to one end of the beam. And as a, as a mechanical device, once it's operating and you've got it running, it's very simple. And it's a sort of technology that could be made in almost any iron foundry. And I suppose that's, that's one of the reasons why things worked fairly well because you know uh, people could repair these things they didn't need an awful lot of repair once they got them going they're built well they're built to last you know in the case of Robinson's engine it's it had a life on five different mines you know, before being retired and then you just put it in a house you know you, you most Cornish engine houses, the bob wall is the strongest part of the engine house. It takes the most weight. The rest of it is just to keep really the cylinder and the remainder of the, the engine in the dry, I think, and keep allow the operators to have somewhere to hide if it rains. What we call the Cornish cycle, um, which runs most of the big pumping engines down here, fairly straightforward steam if we start with the piston at the top of the cylinder we open the inlet valve valve and the exhaust valve at the same time the steam from the boiler then enters the top of the piston thus pushing it down the steam the exhausted steam below the piston then makes its way through the adduction pipe to the condenser under a partial vacuum and the pump rod is pulled up. They discovered by experiment that if you shut the steam valve partway through the stroke, you, the steam would expand for the rest of the stroke 
and thus it gave better running and didn't use quite as much steam. At the bottom of the stroke, the exhaust valve was closed and what we call the equilibrium valve opened, or as the Cornish would call it, the Uncle Abraham valve. I think that's easier than pronouncing equilibrium. And that allowed the pressure to equalize above and below the piston. Thus, as the pump rod then descended under its own weight, then it just made, there was no, you know, it reduced the, uh, the resistance to motion in terms of the piston. The indoor, there are two strokes. The steam stroke is known as the indoor stroke. So the piston is going down and the outdoor or pumping stroke is when the piston is going up and the pump rod is going down. They discovered early on that it was much more beneficial from a pumping point of view to let mother nature and gravity do the work on the pumping stroke rather than use steam to actually push the rod down. So effectively, all the steam does is pull the rods back up, ready for the next stroke. This is a photograph taken of a drawing I got on my living room wall. Um, it shows a section of an sections of an engine house with the cylinder and various valve gear and. I'm not quite sure why the little figure is actually leaning against the wall, but you know, taking it easy, not doing anything. And that is probably what most of you would have seen, at, you know, the remains of houses like that. They're dotted around all over Cornwall and Devon. There's several, there's about 30 in South Australia and good number, there's, I think there's some in Mexico. There's certainly some in South Africa. And there's a section of the shaft. Now, the idea that you have balance box to try and counterweight the weight of the pump rod so that the engine really didn't have much work to do in terms of pulling the rods up. It was all nicely balanced. And there are stories that a good engine driver could tell if something was out of balance and that could be out of balance by a few large rocks or if you have a surface balance box, as they used to say, you had some small child might climb in that and use it as a sort of rocking sort of motion, you know, and the engine driver could tell. At the bottom of the shaft, you have a device which is called a wind bore, and that has a bucket pump attached to it. So the water that ran down to the sump at the bottom would be literally pulled up by the stroke of the engine. The water would then discharge into a cistern um, and then the, the plunger or forcing pumps would then force that water up the shaft in stages. Because you're running an atmospheric engine and you're only using the weight of the rods to move the water, there was actually a limit to the vertical distance that they discovered you could actually expect one set of pumps to push the water up. And that, in this case, you know, they're saying possibly about 180 feet. There are some shafts in Cornwall that you can, or explorers have been in, and in several of these, the pit work is still there. So that includes the, um, the various clack valves and the rising main, bits of pump rod, all sorts. So some of this ironmongery and some of the woodwork is still visible to those who like venturing down. I used to in my, in my younger days, but you wouldn't get me abseiling about three or 400 feet nowadays. I just can't do it. I mentioned a, a family called the Leans. Now, I don't know if this, any of you have heard of this. Um, 
in some respects, they are an unsung part of the development of the steam engine, and yet they are a very, I, I think they're a very important part of it. They, I can't remember which one, I think it was Joel, Joel Lean um, in 1811 published, started to produce a monthly publication, which he called Lean's Engine Reporter. Inside this, you could pay, I think it was so many shillings a month, to have your engine recorded. And uh, this allowed the performance of your steam engines to be displayed in the monthly publication where they could be compared against engines and other mines. Now, the table, I know it's, it's quite a lot of information here. So I'll go across. So in the first column, you have the mine's name and where it is. You have the, the dates that the, the test is done. You have the various engines that may be mentioned. So in the case of Dolcoth, famous mine, they've got two here. They've got the, eight, the great engine, which is the 85 inch. It's got a single action. It's rated at about 378 horsepower. You've got the length of the stroke in the cylinder in feet. You've got the length of the stroke in the pumps. Then you've got the number and description of all the various lifts. So in this case, you've got the P, if you can read any of this on the screen, there's a, there's a P, little P next to that. And that stands for sort of like plunger. And at the bottom, there's one that says D, which stands for drawing. You've got the depth or the length of the lift. So the drawing lift in this case, in the Dolco one at the top is 13 fathoms. And it's got a diameter of 12 and a half inches. There's a load in pounds, it's the amount of water that's actually being lifted per stroke. The, the load per in square inches on the piston. And you think 19 pounds per square inch doesn't actually see as an engineer, you know, you think yeah, 19 pounds per square inch doesn't seem like a, a huge amount of pressure. But if you were to work out what 85 inches is in terms of, uh, of an area each one each square inch having 19 pounds acting on it you work out you know it's several tons there's a counter put on the beam which is a locked box only the the leans had access to that which stopped people from um, fraudulently um, adjusting it that counted the number of strokes and you could work out how many strokes a minute the engine the engine was actually operating under. You could calculate from that what sort of horsepower it was actually sort of operating at. And then you had the, the consumption of coal and a figure, the amount of gallons per minute that it might be moving. And there's a figure, it says here, millions of pounds lifted by one foot, one foot high by consumption of 100 weight of coal. Now that figure is going to be useful because that was the standard uh, method by which engines were compared. Um, it is this consumption of coal or the, the, the amount of water lifted one foot high by burning you know, an amount of coal. And um, there were some, you can consider it, I suppose, a bit like fuel, MPG figures in modern internal combustion engines and people trying to sort of say, well, my car can now do you know, like 50 to the gallon or whatever compared to yours, which only does you know, 35 or whatever. And that led to some interesting developments as the various engineers who were employed to build steam engines across Cornwall were competing against each other to try and come up with the best performing engine. Now this went on for quite a period of time until people discovered actually trying to wring a steam engine out of all the, you know, getting the best out of it 
out of the coal and everything else actually resulted in having excessively high maintenance costs um, which then in years when mines weren't as profitable as they had been it just meant it was easier not to try and you know the, try and maintain this sort of high efficiency and so forth things lapsed but I've spent quite a bit of time playing around with Lean's engine reporter and I've extracted quite a lot of the information. I've got um, a spreadsheet which has got, I'd say, about 90% of all the steam engines and the data in it's held within the copies of Lean's that I've got. Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it yet, but it is certainly makes for interesting reading. There's a book written by um, a lady I can't remember offhand. Uh, it was, I think it's published by the Survivic Society on the leans and the engine reporters. And that's a good read if anyone is, is so interested. They called it the engine's duty. And it was a sort of measure of efficiency. And as mentioned, it's the amount of water in pounds raised one foot high by burning one bushel of coal. A bushel of coal changed its weight in the UK over the time. Um, it started off at about 90 pounds, I think, and then, then got up to nearly 100 weight or maybe a bit more, 118. So this idea of a figure in bushels can be a bit misleading because that doesn't truly give you um, the weight, the amount of coal that's actually burnt. So to give an example here, the weight of water, say 130,000 pounds, the number of strokes made during the monitoring period, say 146,000 bushels of coal, stroke of the engine, and then it's weight of water times the stroke, times the number of strokes divided by the number of bushels. And you end up with a figure that's quoted in millions so in this example, you get 40.7. The graph to the left, hopefully is pretty colours. You might not be able to distinguish individual traces on here, but that wasn't the reason I put it up there. It was just to show you that this is a spread of engine duty figures on a monthly basis for a few years. And you can see that it varies quite significantly from about 30 million up to about 80. But what you do get is that most engines were being reasonably well run and reasonably efficient. We're running in the sort of 50 to 60 millions duty. And that is effectively where they stayed. So from a sort of historical point of view, if nothing else, Lean's Engine Report is one of the very first publications in the world to actually produce regular performance data for a piece of equipment that allowed comparison between manufacturers. And it also allowed for people to experiment and they could then see the results of how increases in steam or the way that the engines were actually operated and the effect it had on the duty that resulted. So I think this idea that, you know, from a modern thing, we like performance tables, we like statistics, you know, if you think of, um, <laughs> if you think of the various sports that no doubt you watch, American footballers and ice hockey players love statistics, love performance, how good people are, how many goals people have scored. So we can go back, I think, from an industrial sort of way back to sort of the leans in 1800 saying, right, we're going to produce a, a publication which displays all this sort of information. If you want a steam engine, um, the size of the engine is normally denoted by the diameter of the cylinder 
and in Cornwall most pumping engines had a range between 35 and 90 inches. The largest beam engine to be produced had a cylinder of 140 inches and that was built by Harveys for a pumping station in the Netherlands. That engine still exists and as far as I know, if you do go and visit, I think it does operate. Most mines in Cornwall started to sort of standardize on engine cylinder sort of diameters between 50 and 80 inches. And I think 80 became a sort of a fairly standard size. Some, some of the bigger mines operated a few 90 inch engines and only one engine, one company in Cornwall had a, an engine which had a hundred inch diameter. Although there were others to operate in other parts of the UK. The picture on the left is the top of a cylinder cover. And the thing you'll notice there is the nice brass or the nice, sorry, the nice copper kettle. Now, I did ask in my ignorance what it, what it was doing there. And I was told that that contains the lubricating oil for the engine. And the reason it's kept on top of the cylinder is to keep it warm and to keep it nice and liquid. Because when it arrives, when you buy it, it comes in a solid lump. You cut the lumps, you cut the chunks off into small chunks, put it in the kettle, heat it up and then you end up with a nice oil that can be used for lubrication. Keith, five yep. minutes. Oh, you're going to be lucky. Other places we might say that mines, that the pumping technology went, um, the Great Western Railway used them in the Seven Tunnel for keeping that clean or clear of water. 14 beam engines there of various sizes. For two weeks, I've got some more statistics, for two weeks worth of pumping there, 381 million UK gallons or 450 million US. Nearly 630 tonnes of coal and 516 pounds in wages and costs of coal. So pumping wasn't cheap and this carried on, This engine, these engines here carried on pumping there until the 1960s when it was all replaced by electricity. The engine house that exists. Most of London's water was pumped by Cornish beam engines. These are pictures of the Grand, 90, the Grand Junction 90 at the Kew Bridge, which some of you, I recommend some of you visit. They steam it. It's the largest operating steam engine of its kind in the world. Another place, if you haven't been, and if people come over here, is the Papelwick pumping station outside Nottingham. This has a pair of very fine James Watt Company rotative beam engines. And the company, when they built this uh, pumping station, had so much money, or they had money left over, shall we say, from the budget that they turned it into, you know, it's really, really fancy stained glass windows, all sorts of decorations. The engines are immaculate. Um, you can go and have a wedding there if you, you wish, you know, and people do to get married amongst the steam. The boiler house contains the original six Lancashire boilers, only one is used now for, for steaming, the rest are there for show. You know, gentleman getting coal out, with a, out of a, a large wheelbarrow with a shovel, full-time job for him. They do operate. It's uh, it's it's a really interesting place. Yeah. 
I did find that the engines were just slightly out of sync, so that's why you know they could have this sort of odd oscillating motion. Lots of steam engines were used for not only moving water that you might want to drink, but these ones at the clay mills outside Burton on Trent, famous for its umpteen, I don't know, 40 or 50 breweries that used to be there, was used for removing the wastewater from the brewery because they had been dumping it in the river, which wasn't really a good idea. So they decided to use some beam engines to pump it four miles away. And these were saved from demolition and it's now another museum you can wander around. They have three out of the four uh, operational. The last one is in the process of being restored. Well worth a visit. London had an immense problem with its waste water and the effluent that, that dumped in the river caused what was known as the Great Stink, even meant that the Houses of Parliament had to be abandoned because of the smell. And the gentleman by the name of Joseph Bazalgette came up with a scheme that said, right, I will build a solution to the sewage problem, the crisis that ha have, and it's his sewers that sit underneath London now are still being used for the process for which they were designed. He built two pumping stations to dump the raw sewage or even treated sewage into the river downstream of London. This cross ness was the southern station. Um, and yes, the colours there maybe slightly they I think the photography they slightly tweak the colouring to be a bit bright but yes for a beam engine house they the place looked amazing you know they are true colours um, it wasn't all dull inside there the shareholders had quite a lot of money to spend on this and when they discovered they had some money left over they just went overboard with the decoration and therefore it looks really, really fancy. Right, the last slide I'm going to talk about tonight is the northern uh, station called Abbey Mills that had eight beam engines in it, again installed as part of the, the sewage system. On the left is one of the 94 contract drawings that have been rescued, I suppose, who have survived. They're in one of the archives and I photographed them. They're all lithographed. Unfortunately, they're on a fairly rigid backing, but they have been folded at some stage and they got creases in and therefore photographing them completely flat was almost impossible. But it gives you an idea of the sort of the quality of the drawings and the workmanship. Now, the engine house now still survives. It's a listed industrial monument. It doesn't have any steam engines in it anymore. They got replaced in, I think, the 1930s by electricity. The two chimneys, which were 150 foot high, had to be taken down during the war because they were afraid that the Germans might bomb the place and the, and the uh, chimneys might collapse on the engine house itself. It's what happens when you have an industrial process, you have shareholders that have quite a lot of money to spend and you give it, you give an architect free reign to design an industrial building, which is going to make a statement. And, you know, if you go from what, what effectively is the fairly bland, um, functional Cornish engine houses where we start our talk, you end up with what is this, um, they call Abbey Mills the Cathedral of Sewage because of the quality of the building and the, an amazing architecture that is still there to be seen. And at that point, I am going to stop. And we'll say, has anyone got any questions? Anyone a, have questions? 
There's a stunned silence. <laughs> just just uh, one thought, Keith. I mean, the thing that amazed me the first time uh, I saw a steam engine operating in the UK was how quiet it was. <laughs> you think about the normal noisy uh, mining operations, but in the engine houses, must have been pretty quiet. Well, they actually, they're asked, yeah, once you get a pumping engine running and as long as it's supplied with steam and everything else, the engine, once you've got a big enough vacuum, the engine runs itself and they are quiet. And um, yeah, it's the one thing you do notice if you go to any of the um, steam museums is that the engines, there's a, there is very little noise and it's, you know, but it is, it's, um, it's, I'm going to say it's very therapeutic. Yeah. And, you know, you can just sit and watch this stuff all day. Well, we did at one. You know, you sit there for about an hour watching it. You know, it's, it's great. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the leans, and I found that I had this book, <laughs> book on my shelf on the steam engine Cornwall with all the duties and stuff from the 1830s. Yeah. And I had gotten this. I don't know where I got it. But I was trying to research the Petherick family because they had were involved here in the States in some copper mines and some lead mines up in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, and then the anthracite region, Thomas okay. Petherick. So it was either him or his son was also one of the founders of AIME. And so it's just, you know, when you mentioned that, I said, wait a minute, I have a book on something like that. <laughs> and I remember yeah. reading it and saying, that is really cool. And I've got this little... A Cornish engine house here from Blue Hills Tin Streams made a Cornish Tim. Yeah. So there's my uh, souvenir, I, nice and small. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But you know, you you could in one of the other books um, I've got it mentions about. Um, if we sort of move from pumping engines to sort of winding engines and the removal of all that way um, it mentions the cook's kitchen steam winder which in about 1850 there was no other steam engine in the in the united states that could, could compete with it but yet when you get to about 18 19 1900s it's still produce, moving the same amount of rock in Cornwall as it had done in 1850. But however, the steam engines on the um, places like Calumet and Heckler and the Quincy had then got their big, their big um, conical winders and things. And some of their, those steam engines are just absolutely huge. Some of the mines in my area in Maryland in the 1850s, 60s, all they did the water wheel, but with the Cornish pit work. And then yeah. uh, one of them was near the B&O Railroad. So it had the Cornish the pit work, but it had a horizontal uh, American style steam engine, but probably was running pretty slow. I mean, you can't run at high RPM. The system's not designed for that. So it must have been one of the slowest horizontal engines. But, you know, with Baltimore, everything was being everything was thinking railroad, you know, so they used what they had, I guess. 50, 60, 50, 60 horsepower, something like that. Yeah, you're not looking, I mean, with, with, a, with a set of Cornish pit work, you're not looking at more than about 12 strokes a minute. Because if you start doing the calculations of how fast this pit work is traveling in a, in a, in a down direction, then it's got to stop and then it's got to go back up again. You've got several tons of wood and cast iron that's all moving at one go and you've got to stop it and then change direction. So there's, there is actually a physical limit to how fast you can, you can run one of these things before things start breaking. Yeah. That's not to say that the Cornish miners didn't actually run. There is an example of um, one of the mines where a 70 inch engine was run at, I think it was 12 and a half strokes a minute. And they said that at that speed, the water was gaining on the mine. But if they ran it at nearly 13 strokes a minute, the engine kept the water out, you know, and it, would, it was, it was, a, it's a, 
it's a battle, unfortunately, the Cornish had and still have, you know, when whenever mining re, re, restarts in Cornwall in any great fashion, the removal of water is going to be one of the limiting factors. What's the difference between a Cornish boiler and a Lancashire boiler? Right. Uh, in simple terms, a Cornish boiler has one flue or central uh, tube with a with with a with a fire in it, and a cor and a Lancashire one has two parallel tubes with fire in. So it's it's a slightly more efficient way of heating the water inside. Um, these Lancashire boilers did power a lot of Cornish steam engines in latter years, but Cornish boilers may, mainly were used uh, for powering horizontal engines where you needed quite a lot of, you needed, needed a lot more steam. It's just an, imp I would say a Lancashire boiler is an, is an improvement upon the Cornish design. Hi, Keith. This is Dick Reed. Hey, I was wondering if you've done any research on the pumping up at the Comstock mine in Nevada. Um, I am interested in, I will, I've had a look. I know they, they had, they had big single cylinder sort of rotative um, steam engines uh, for pumping. And I think they, what you, what I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what I think that the, uh, you guys in the States call a Cornish system, they would have had pit work a bit like the Cornish uh, with a rod moving down the shaft, but it wouldn't have been powered by a beam engine as I knew it. They're powered more by a sort of rotative engine. Yeah, the, I, I, from what I've read, the, um, the Comstock did pump huge quantities of water. Um, and they had that same battle that some of the water wasn't particularly um, pleasant in terms of its chemical sort of makeup and maybe it's even its acid levels, you know, that, which is an issue you, you certainly get in Cornwall, uh, especially with copper sulfides, uh, you know, copper sulfide and water produces sulfuric acid. So, you know, your engine or, and your pit work does get eaten. Um, I haven't found a huge amount of detail on the on the pumping and the Comstock. Um, it's certainly it's certainly something I would be interested in. Um, at some stage, at some stage, there might well be a book, you know, on the pumping of water from mines by steam or something like that. You know, and it, it will go hands in hands with where more or less where the Cornish went. But so I'm doing I'm doing a load of research at the moment. But I say if anyone comes across any sort of like pumping figures for the Comstock, I would be certainly be interested to see them. One, th one thing I just saw the other day, Keith, in the Comstock is the, uh, first they put it in the Sutro tunnel, you know, which was going to drain the whole uh, Comstock load. And uh, they had a, have a, a group of people that purport to be trying to preserve it or to re reopen it in some fashion. But the interesting thing is they have a drone flying through the the portion of the tunnel that's down at the uh, at the discharge end, and it's pretty interesting just to see what uh, what what is in there, and that they actually got the drone back out alive. <laughs> at the uh, Sutro end, at the Sutro tunnel. Sutro tunnel. That's right. Yes. Yeah, it's quite a it's quite a quite a feat of engineering. That I mean, it's it's sort of. It, it's typical sort of Cornish design, you know, we'll, we'll go down to the lowest point, drive an enormously, enormously long and expensive tunnel and let the water come out of that right. for, sort of, you know, by gravity um, and reduce the pumping costs by whatever, however far we can, we can reduce it. But I, from what I understand, unfortunately, the, the tunnel came sort of <laughs> about 10, 15 years too late to, re to really make a huge difference. I think by the time it was finished, yeah, I think you know, com the mining on the Comstock was on a on a downward trend. Whereas if it had arrived, say, twenty years earlier, when a lot of the Cornish 
first arrived, I think uh, I think things might have been very different. Yes, that's correct. Well, thank you so much, Keith. No problem. And, and thank you to everybody else for showing up.